AIDS group, and I was secretary, surprise, surprise, to the Scottish Borders Africa AIDS group, but he managed to escape last year. Um, well, I managed to escape, and the chap who took over when we suddenly jumped ship in the middle of the year, <laughs> leaving an email to the chairman saying, no, 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 no never mind, Tim Usher has all the details. <laughs> no, 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 so no, no, when so. Tim came back again. <laughs> Tim has also spoken to us on more than one occasion before. He comes from a a military family, and mm. I know our SPAG committee meetings were always enlivened by his tales uh, that he would suddenly come out with family from his military life and some other sort of thing. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tim Usher, who's going to talk about the life of his grandfather. Tim. I should have learned long ago not to open my mouth but I'm afraid I'm one of those awful people that if somebody says something it lights something up inside me and out comes an anecdote. I've been like that and my poor wife oh god here comes that one again um, but it's true and suddenly one day I was telling Isabel about how a lion got my grandfather's <coughs> horse in Nigeria while he was fishing or something of that nature and she said, you read him out to come and talk to the Thursday group about it. And I thought, yes, what a good idea. Um, because this, what you're going to get today is the story of a chap who was a bit of a warrior. He was a bit of a wild chap. He finished up and a fairly glorious finish to his career. Born in 1865, came to live with us when I was about seven or eight during <coughs> Hitler's war. So I had him and my splendidly Edwardian grandmother for those years of my life, yes, between 7 and 17. And I always reckon that anything I ever learned that was worth learning, I learned from them. Uh, I will digress all the time. Granny, for example, was very much of the type of person who said, you can do anything you like as long as you don't frighten the horses. <laughs> and take what you want, says the Lord. Take it, but pay for it. But the best one of the lot was not long before she died. By then I had two daughters who were sort of that size. And one day she looked at me very seriously and said, Timmy, you've got two daughters. Now, you've got a duty to your daughters not to let them to go to the devil until you're happy that they can go to the devil like a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, well, that's all I'm digressing already. My grandfather, as I say, was born in 1865 into a family called Wilkinson. Now, his father persuaded the Durham historian Surtees to produce a sort of map of the Wilkinsons. And they go back to the early 1600s to a Richard Wilkinson who farmed at a place called Coxhoe in County Durham. Well, the years went by and lots of Wilkinsons got born and I'm damn sure that Johnny Wilkinson, the footballer, is a cousin of mine, or some kind of kin of mine. And I met a young man in the Royal Regiment of Scotland the other day called Craig Wil Wilkinson, who comes from Duns. And I said, have you any idea where your family comes from? 
And he said, oh, he said, my father says we all came up from Northumberland. Now the kin's bound to <laughs> Anyway, the years went by, and the line down which my grandfather came got into merchant, um, merchant adventuring. They carried coals from Newcastle to Cowrie and came back with something else, and they made a lot of money, and a lot more money, and a lot more money. And they bought property, and they married heiresses, at least, at least three times in three different generations. Um, one heiress was called Deborah Maha Maha, and her family traced their ancestry back to the Emperor Nero. But <laughs> I haven't actually proved that. Um, and by the mid 1700s, William Wilkinson was made High Sheriff of Northumberland. So you can see it's the old thing of Cooley to Mandarin and back to Cooley in so many generations. Well, I'm a Cooley at the other end. Um, and William's son Thomas fought at the Battle of Bun Bunker's Hill and was known as Bunker Wilkinson there afterwards. He tried to get into Parliament, but they wouldn't have him. He was too right wing for that part of the world. And his son, oh yes, he married an heiress um, called Hannah Spearman. And the, the estate was a place called Old Acres in County Durham, which sadly now lies beneath a suburb of Chester the Street or something, it's gone. But I have a splendid schematic plan of old acres, you know, how they draw the house in the middle and there's trees here and there's water there, it's that sort of schematic thing. And she was Hannah Spearman. And again I digress, rolling stones seldom gather much moss and what you see there is about all that grandfather left me. This splendid pot has the Spearman crest on it. And Thomas and Hannah's son, Percival, was called Percival Spearman Wilkinson. And he was Percival Spearman Wilkinson the first, and his son was the second, and my grandfather was the third, Percival Spearman Wilkinson. Anyway, um, by then they lived in a house called Mount Oswald, South Durham, now the fine place with a sort of Palladian frontage, which in those days a lot of people built sort of follies and smart things, and as a result ran out of money which I think the Wilkinsons did, but he was brought up there. Um, he had three older sisters and four younger brothers. And sadly, his mother took the youngest brother to the circus one day, caught scarlet fever and died, which chagrined my grand great-grandfather very much indeed. But her cousin came up from Shropshire to look after the children. And so grandfather and all his siblings grew up with this nice lady looking after them. Until one day, great-grandfather said, you will have to leave. You remind me too much about my dead wife. <laughs> so she left. <laughs> and she came up to Edinburgh and founded Lansdowne House School. Does that mean anything to anybody here? It's a sort of, for a long time, it was the sixth form part of St. George's School in Edinburgh. Sort of day school. Anyway, that's all by the by. Grandfather was a wild young and his, his pals were all Durham Miner's sons down the road, and he was always mucking about with them. And even in those days, he was a tremendous naturalist. And his grandfather, PSW I, was dying, and summoned all his descendants and his grandchildren to get his final blessing. He, incidentally, took holy orders but never practiced. Um, and where was grandfather? And he couldn't be found. And Great grandfather died, and blah, blah, blah. he was eventually found. He'd been investigating a badger's set down at the bottom of the garden with his pals from the village. Anyway, that was him, and they all grew up together. And he was sent to a prep school called Aysgarth, which is up in the hills of North Yorkshire, mm -hmm. where the very first thing he did, apparently, this is not in his diary, his, his wife told me, was he saw somebody bending over and he went and kicked it. And it turned out to be the head boy, which wasn't a good start. However, later on, they were all walking up in the hills, and Grandfather, with his sort of natural knowledge, said to the master, look, we mustn't walk up this burn. There's been a huge cloud burst up there, and there's a flood going to come down. He said, oh, shut up, boy, shut up, boy. And so he got in all these pals to go up the hill, and sure enough, a wall of water came down this gully and nearly took the master away. And that is all I know about his time at his prep school, but it 
give you a sort of taste of the sort of person he was. He went from there to Uppingham, where he excelled at cricket, tennis, fives. There's another one, cricket anyway. And years later, I was playing cricket at Uppingham against the gents of Leicester, no less. And I went into the pavilion, and sure enough, there was grandfather's name, having been in the 11 in, in about 1878 and 1879. Nothing more is known about his time at Uppingham, except that he did not attend to his studies the way he should have done, and he took the army exam and failed. Um, he was still pretty wild. His father sent him to Heidelberg to sort of get more education. And he obviously did get more education there because in later life he spoke pretty passable French and pretty passable German. But he got involved in a fracas in an ice rink at Heidelberg and was caught trying to slash somebody with an escape and was prompted to port him back to this country where he very sensibly joined the Northumbrian militia. And that was the beginning of the rest of his life, because he obviously had sobered up enough, and he managed to get himself a regular commission in the Northumberland Fusiliers, the fifth, the fighting fifth, the old and the bold, who were a lovely lot. Um, at some point in his life, he started to keep a diary. And I have a shelf full of them at home, but the first one is 1898. And anything that happened before that got destroyed in a tent fire. So all his time in India as a subaltern, as a young man, as I think it was the second or something of the years, is lost. And all I have are reminiscences from my grandmother and from him. And again, <coughs> never still for one moment, always playing cricket or pig sticking or playing <coughs> polo. Um, <coughs> firmly disobeying the rules of not consorting with the natives. He consorted furiously with the natives, he had a lot of friends amongst them. Um, he was several times asked by villagers to come up and deal with a man-eating leopard or a nasty bear or something, because um, he was very good at that sort of thing. And one day he said he was up there and um, he was in this cave and he suddenly heard snuffle, 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 snuffle. And it was his spaniel. And it had followed him all the way up from the hot, dusty plains below up into this hill village. And he said, Tim, you know, it really makes you think. And I thought he was going to talk about the loyalty of animals and things. How much we humans must stink. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, he shot the bear, which, which appeared later. His, yes. The dog came and lay beside him and he suddenly felt the dog doing that. And suddenly the darkness in the mouth of the cave got even darker. And this was the bear. So he shot it in the dark with a gun called a Paradox, which was a 12 ball with the last two inches of each barrel rifled. And you could put a solid shot through it. This was typical of that part of the world. You either wanted to shoot a peacock or something for your supper, or you had something bigger charging you. And next day, they went out and they found it. And um, he challenged the village, village sort of hunter to skin it. So they started each one on one side of the bear and started skinning like fury. Grandfather said, he beat me to it, but my God, he made a mess of it. Mine was much cleaner, he said. <laughs> anyway, that was the sort of life he lived in India. They played polo. He had his best mate was a chap called Boy Booth. And between them, they kept three polo ponies, so they couldn't both play on the same day. And I think they shared one dress shirt. And that's all they could manage on their extremely poor pay. Um, and that really is all I can tell you about his time in India, except that he obviously did make good friends with the Patans. And I'll come on to this later, because he comes back to India much, much later in his life. Well, he went from India sometime, <coughs> I think in about 1896, and was posted to the Northern Nigeria Regiment, which was part of the, what became part of the West African Frontier Force, which 
in due course with the, uh, the Northern Nigeria Regiment, the Southern Nigeria Regiment, the Gold Coast Regiment, and the Sierra Leone Regiment, and the Nigerian Mounted Infantry, who were all stationed up in the north of Nigeria. And he spent the next, said he, quickly looking, um, yeah, he, he spent at least three years with the Northern Nigeria Regiment, probably as their adjutant. And it was a very busy time, there was much rushing about, there was much, and forgive me for being politically incorrect, shaking of trees and black men fell out of them and they turned them into soldiers. I mean, uh, you know, he, he, had to, he had to attest them and some of them were rejected because they were obviously not suitable and some were given. Anyway, they eventually got turned into very smart and very good soldiers. Um, he would have a very, very busy day out in the bush doing this and the other training. Come back in the evening, we had a game of cricket. Come back in the evening, we had a game of polo, etc., etc. But one of the great dangers was that the Europeans, and there were European officers in all these regiments, and quite a lot of European NCOs to sort of bring on the training. Um, they had yellow fever, black water fever, malaria. And somewhere in one of his diaries, there's a page of European people who've been posted out there who had died in this three-year period. And there was a whole list of them. There's only one who was killed in action. And it would have been an action against tribes who were being <coughs> beaten to the next door tribe. And the next door tribe had asked us for protection. And there were lots of little battles like that. Um, which we generally won because we had the better weapons. But all these people died of this, died of that, died of that, invalided, 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 and it was fever of some kind. Grandfather got fever. Um, his diary would say, felt feverish, took my usual dose of champagne and quinine, <coughs> and woke in the morning feeling much better. <laughs> well, you know, I, I could stand there for hours talking about the little things they did. But just let's take it that he was in the Northern Nigeria Regiment for three years. They used to come back, um, they'd get about three months leave in, in the year. Well, no, no, he had two years without any leave at all. And three months leave, but it took, you know, quite a long time to come back by steamship and going out again by steamship. And those steamship journeys in themselves were fairly hairy, but particularly trying to land on the West African coast, where there were very few proper port facilities. And you landed, and there was a big swell, and they brought out what they called bumboats, and you got into them. And getting ashore was quite hairy, then alone getting back out again. I've experienced this myself. I digress. I was for two years the personal slave of the Governor General of New Zealand. I was his ADC, or one of them. And one of the New Zealand ADC's jobs was to visit all the South Pacific dependencies who used New Zealand as their sort of candy to the rest of the world. And there was the Cook Islands, a courtesy visit to Tahiti, um, Fiji, the Palmerston, the Kermadex, the Tokelau, and all the rest of it. And we were in a New Zealand battle cruiser called HMZS Royalist, which had been built for the Murmansk colored convoys and therefore was totally unsuited for the heat of the South Pacific and everybody slept out on deck. But anyway, you would arrive off this island and down would go the gangplank and out would come this big canoe with about sort of eight, 16 rows that come out over the reef. And we, in our feathers and our sort of smart kit, would go down the ladder and get into the thing and sit there, the Raj, and they'd row in and you'd arrive just at the edge of the reef and cocks and they and they'd all come in and and you look back, there was this 15 foot wave behind you, but it sort of collapsed and drove you forward. Well, coming in was fine. An animal will tell you that taking off is no problem, it's the landing that's difficult. Going out, you were sitting there looking at these huge great things coming in, and suddenly the coxswain would give it a shout, and they were like hell, and you were over the top the other side. And then it was all very calm because the Romans were great big, gentle 15 foot roads. I digress, but. That was what landing in West Africa was like in those days. Um, anyway, he came back, and I think his fourth year out there, he went to the Gold Coast, as it was then, where there was a bit of civilization at the coast, 
and there were gold mines being operated by gold miners up the hills. And there was the kingdom of Ashanti, who were a very warlike tribe, and every now and again they spilled out and started to sort of be unkind to other people and rob the gold miners and all the rest of it. And there were, in all, five Ashanti wars. The first one was in, seven, it was in 1870 something. But in my grandfather's time, um, he did two years with, in the Gold Coast as part of the West African Frontier Force. I think it was the South Nigeria Regiment responsible for it at the time. But he went back out there and discovered that they'd raised the Gold Coast Regiment out of the police um, who operated in Accra, the, the capital. And he suddenly found himself commanding his own battalion of the Gold Coast Regiment. And the Ashanti started giving trouble again. And my grandfather, he started, said, you know, it's such a pity this, because the king was a great friend of mine. You know, the king used to go stalking with him, and hearty beast, bang, you know. Um, but you know, there they were, and they, the, the, the gold miners and others were locked up in a sort of fortress. And the Ashanti were rushing around, throwing things at them and shouting at them. So they had to have another expedition. Well, again, I won't dwell on it, but in fact, it, they were very good warriors. But fortunately, they didn't have modern firearms. They had sort of blunderbuss weapons, and they were firing old nails and any bit of metal they could find. And in that battle, grandfather got a piece of something, went in between the skin and the back of his skull and out the other side which laid him out for a few days, but I always say he missed the Boer War because he was wounded in the war before. <laughs> it wasn't quite like that, actually. The Boer War was already going on. In fact, his best friend, Boy Boo, was killed. Um, and he recorded that in his diary. You know, the only friend I have in the world, type of thing. Very sad. Anyway, um, I'm digressing a little bit, but at this particular point, they, they say the Ashantis built these sort of barriers, and the rest was thick, thick jungle, the park thing, and you had to sort of break through each of these barriers. Well, um, we had Maxim guns and we had, you know, four pounder artillery, and eventually you blast these things apart, but not without a lot of fighting and a lot of casualties. Anyway, they eventually got into Kumasi, the capital of Ashanti, and he got an order from Lugard, who was the governor of the whole lot, um, to get hold of the king of, king of Ashanti's stool, which was a sort of ceremonial stool. I furiously, my other half, I forgot to ask her, I have a tiny, tiny little gold replica of the Ashanti stool. And it was sort of about that long, and it was sort of shaped like that, and it had two legs underneath. Anyway, that was rather like the the stone at school, that sort of same importance to the Ashanti. And grandfather got this order to destroy it. And he did the Nelson trick. He turned a, a telescope to his blind eye and didn't destroy it. And said to the Ashanti, look, I'm not going to destroy your king's throne. Take it away and hide it. And don't let anybody see it. And the Ashanti royal family were banished to the Seychelles or something for a period. Um, I was fascinated the other day he, the, the present king of Ashanti um, was burgled and lost, lost a lot of jewellery, um, but not his throne, and it's still there. However, I digress once more. Years and years and years, years later, my sister married somebody called Andrew Bruce, who, amongst other things, was the Grand Master Mason of the Scottish Lodges. And part of his brief was to go around the world visiting Scottish Masonic lodges. And they pitched up in Accra, no, in, in Kumasi, um, where there was a Scottish Mason lodge, and went to the museum. And my sister spotted this sort of bit and saw this picture of my grandfather. And she said in passing, uh, my, my grandfather was here a long time ago, and I think fought in one of the battles. Who, who was he? Well, he was Colonel Wilkinson. Ah, Colonel Wilkinson, ah! You know, and, and she was always so carried out on our shoulders. He's a local hero because he saved the king's stool. So that was one of the things he did. But in commanding this battalion of soldiers in action was also quite a good tip on his um, um, 
the curriculum vitae, because his next job was commanding the second Northumberland Fusiliers at Dover, his old regiment, by which time he was a proper lieutenant colonel. I mean, he was a lieutenant colonel, he was a temporary lieutenant colonel when he was in West Africa. Um, and he had no diaries at all for 1909 to, forgive me, I think about 1913. Yes, well, he probably had two and a half years commanding. And I went to Annick, which was the headquarters of Northumberland Fusiliers, and asked to see back numbers of the St George's Gazette, which was their regimental magazine. And marvellous stuff, but so incredibly non-personal. There were no I was there stories, unless it was somebody who'd nearly been run over by a buffalo somewhere, or you know, that sort of I was out there type of thing. But actually, what they were doing back in Dover, it would never have known that my grandfather was there, let alone as a commanding officer, until you came to the cricket schools. Northumberland <laughs> Fusiliers against the Cameron Highlanders, blah blah blah, blah. Colonel Wilkinson, LBW for three, took four wickets, and that repeated itself. Otherwise, you'd never known he was there. So one must assume that he did all right, because his next job was back in India again, commanding a brigade at Secundrabad. However, I have jumped ahead of myself. Go back to, no, it's still up ahead of me, yes. His next job, he was made Inspector General of the West African Frontier Force with the local rank of Brigadier. And this job entailed basically walking or riding on a pony because there were no, by the time he finished four years of that, or three or four years of that, there was a a railway up from Lagos to Kano in the middle of North Nigeria and there was a sort of bit of a road network but that was all there was and there was a bit of a road network around Accra and the Sierra Leone didn't even have that so all this visiting little villages all with the little sort of territorial army type sections of soldiers um, and then a big headquarters for the North, North Niger or South Nigeria region or the Mountain, Nigerian Mounted Infantry all had to be visited and you got there with ponies on your feet and with bearers bringing all your camping kit along with you. And grandfather, most of the journeys took three or four days from village to village to village. I mean, it was like going from you know, a village in the south of England, halfway up England to the borders. And it's that sort of four days walk. And grandfather hunted with a bear to get fresh meat for everybody. And he fished. He never caught a tiger fish. He said, they're the very devil. You get them on and you're broken. They're gone. Terrible thing. But, you know, he was shooting various forms of deer, literally for the pot. And he, he always had two or three younger officers with him, sort of staff officers with him. And there was one in his second year who obviously didn't like it at all, all this sort of shooting and things. And he turned to my grandma and said, you're very bloodthirsty, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I said, me bloodthirsty? No, not a bit, you know. But that's how things were in those days. And I think it was that called Edwards, and he came to a, a sad end, because again in the diary, some village in Nigeria had to leave Edwards behind, poor fellow, who has the fever. Four days later, a messenger with a forked stick appeared Edwards has died, poor chap. You know, on you plodded. I mean, this was a sort of part of, part of the course out there. Um, anyway, he did this, and he, I think his first year, he did North Nigeria. And the fitness, the effort, um, every now and again, you see, um, had, a, had a European morning, i.e., he didn't get up till six in the morning. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, you, you were up at four and you had to pack up the camp and by six you'd had your breakfast, what it was of it, and you were off on your next sort of 30 mile walk, day 30 mile walk and 30 mile stalk to see if you could shoot something on the way. Um, but that was that. You'd arrived at the village and there was a certain amount of dashing, i.e. you dashed the village headman, something, 
not beads, I can show it, but something more valuable than that. And you got back from the village headman fresh vegetables. And you had a bit of a pisser. And then you went to bed, the next morning you got up and off you went to the next pit. Having inspected the sort of 15 rifles and all the rest of it and shown them how to get rid of the rust on their rifles. And, yeah, but that, that's what his job was. As I say, every now and again he'd stop off at one of the big depots and have a bit of a relax and he'd inspect the whole lot. And he, he, he already knew most of the senior officers there. Um, so he sort of felt at home. And again, he came back for three months' holiday every year. Now, his second year, he did the Gold Coast, and then he came back. And back in this country, he reported to the Colonial Office, not the War Office, and got his orders and did a bit of you know, forward planning. But the rest of the time was his own, and it was in the summer. And he played cricket, he fished, he did all the sort of things that a chap did in those days. And he used to go to the theatre, and it's marvellous and everything. Went to the theatre with um, so and so, and Lady so and so, and Mrs. so and so, and Miss CMHB. Miss CMHB. And obviously, a, a romance was building up. However, he went to the Gold Coast and did another year of doing what he did. Um, went back to Kumasi where he was welcomed and I won't bore you with the detail and my, my aunt, my, my mother's younger sister, went through all his diaries a long time ago and then gave them to me and she said you won't find a book in that, it's so boring, it's all about the performance of the Maxim gun and how many people they shot out of trees that day and you know, dead boring and she's quite right but Gripping nonetheless. If you use your imagination, he was a chap of, in his 30s, going on 40s, putting in this incredible physical effort of just being alive and doing things, having to cope with friends dropping like flies, um, bad soldiers who nicked things, and uh, I mean, they literally, I don't know if any of you heard that, <coughs> the trick they used to use in Kina, if one of the Kikuyu um, hands, misbehave. They'd line them all up and they'd heat up the pan and it was really hot. They'd stick out your tongues and they went along touching the tongues of everyone. Eventually one of them would break away because everybody else was not guilty. Their tongues were therefore wet. But this chap, his tongue had gone dry and this was the way they worked out who, who was a crook. It's rather, it, it, it's totally out clever people that. Another friend who grew coffee in Kenya and he said, we've got this marvellous machine, coffee beans go along a belt, and they go through a machine, the machine can detect the beans that aren't right, and as it goes by, it goes, and the bean gets shot out, and the rest go off. But it's the same sort of technique was used to find out who committed the crime. Um, I'm lost, I'm in, it's his second year, and I'm in the Gold Coast, as I said. And he came back, and there was more sort of going to play in office, playing cricket, blah blah blah. But then you came to fairly late on in July, and it's the Helmsley Cricket Week, or Cricket Weekend, and he plays cricket, and come Monday, there's a little something written at the top, and then there's a question mark. And then the diary's empty until the 30th of August got married at St George's Church <laughs> and then it goes entirely quiet again the next day of the diary dropped anchor in Madeira and he was on his way back this time to Sierra Leone. Um, a really stone girl is near Moss but this is this delightful little thing. The Hempstead Cricket Man, Cricket Week 1910 from and there's a whole two whole lists of initials including at least one, if not two, single initials, which denotes an hour or something. Um, that's not a lot of them. Anyway, this came down to me and I treasure it because of its sort of provenance. Anyway, the day after that, he and my granny got married. Now she was the daughter of a fairly rumbustious gunner, Major General, came from South Ayrshire. And he, like all his family, were very wild. Um, it was said of him that on a Saturday night he'd 
tie one on at the club in India and he'd get into his buggy and the horse would know what to do and drive him home. And his bearer would heave him out and put him to bed. And next morning, as always, there was church parade. And he was always there on church parade, but he was considered to be terribly devout because he went into the church and he was at the front there and he got down and prayed. And he never got up again. <laughs> <laughs> he prayed and prayed. Then, and now I remember God, I'll tell him, he'd wake up and then he's been home again. Well, that was walking on the blur. Anyway, Granny had, therefore, uh, a bit of a military upbringing, and perhaps she wasn't quite as sheltered as some of her contemporaries. And I don't know what the spark was between them, but she was 19 and he was 45. And by which time he was a local brigadier in West Africa. And apparently all my grandmother's friends, girlfriends, used to call him Brigadier. And he was calling my grandmother, he was incredibly young and fit. Um, and that was probably what he looked like at the time he got engaged to my grandmother. But he would have been 45 by then, but very young and very fit. Anyway, they got married and he dumped her with her mother and came out for his third year um, as an inspector general. And this time he went back to Nigeria. And this is actually a very tough year. They did South Nigeria. And the Niger sort of goes like that down. And I turn the right way around for you. And off to here, there's another big river that goes off eastwards. And they had to come down that river. And it was um, full of hostile tribes. It was a virtually untamed part of Nigeria. And they came down in canoes. And they were constantly sort of looking behind bushes and wondering where the arrows were going to come out at them. And it was very feverish. Anyway, he got to the end of it. And more or less what mopped his brow and said, thank God that's the end of that. Well, it was, and I'm just trying to think, is there anything major I should have told you about his time in West Africa? Um, anyway, right, that was it. West Africa, West African Frontier Force. And he came back home, and in 1913, he was sent with my grandmother to India and he was commanding a brigade at Sekundra Bay. Um, in those days, <coughs> regular officers who'd served with native forces were regarded with a bit of suspicion by the establishment. And he was constantly being caught out on terminology and you know, not being absolutely like that all the time. He's much more relaxed than a person. Um, a typical example, he had to give orders for a, a training attack. And he said, at dawn, blah, 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 blah. And afterwards, an even more senior general said, Percy, you know it's not dawn, it's first light. <laughs> well, he was constantly tripping over little things like that, that perhaps he'd forgotten while he was <coughs> trying to talk Ibu or whatever language. He, he did actually learn a lot, and again in his diary there are pages of the local name for all kinds of wildlife, wildebeest, hardy beasts, lions, and the native name for it. And uh, he never actually tried to speak North Nigeria when he was at home, but I'm sure he could tell you that you know, a hardy beast was a blower or something. Anyway, they were in India and enjoying the fruits of married life, and. One of the great pleasures was that one of the regiments in his brigade was the Shropshire Light Infantry, where his youngest brother, Clem, was by then a major. And that's Clem. And you probably don't think about it, but he married a lovely lady called Ruth, who lived to just over 100. And I went to see her when she was about 99. And she used to come rushing up to Scotland and her nieces, my mother and my aunt, who were becoming what you might call um, comely middle-aged ladies by then and not in any hurry to do anything. Ruth actually tore them around Edinburgh to botanical gardens or something like that. And Ruth by then was well into her 90s. But anyway, that was Clem. And this photograph of him, very likely with not quite so much of a moustache, was on her dressing table. And a cousin of hers from her side of the family 
came in while I was there, took one look at this photograph and looked at me and went, ah! <laughs> and I got another picture of him and I must confess it myself. He was a sort of bigger, stronger person than I was, I've ever been. Um, anyway, that was one of the pleasures they had, but Granny said there was one day they were walking along somewhere in the town and he suddenly said, go home, I'll be back in about three days. And then he said, down the street. And she said, these two enormously tall locals appeared and they all, ah, and disappeared off into the darkness. And these were two sort of six foot seven inch batons who we'd known when he was a subaltern many years before. And sure enough, it took about four days for him to come back. <laughs> but uh, you know, that was the way he lived his life. He wasn't appreciated at all. Anyway, he did what you have to do, commanding a brigade in India, lots of rushing around, inspecting people, exercising, playing polo, pig sticking, um, looking after the socks for the children, and all the things that soldiers have to do. But his diary is just sort of office morning, blah, 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 three chuggers of polo this afternoon, had a great fun, something like that. And that that's what he lived for, was anything to do with wildlife or sporting activity. And Gradually, in his diary, the impending war with the Kaiser was beginning to bubble up. I mean, I did telegraph work by then, and they knew what was happening. And for sure, war broke out. And um, I think the Northumberland Fusiliers, 1st Battalion, were part of um, the British Expeditionary Force that went over and stopped on Cook, whatever it was, at Mons. Um, but he was desperate, you know, he wanted to get into it. Anyway, he got an order in, not that it matters particularly, yes, in about September 1914, he got the order to come back to this country and drilled it quickly, blah, blah. So he did, he packed and he left my grandmother heavily pregnant with my mother at Comfort Line, Secunderabad, India. And he came back, and to his utter frustration, he was kept kicking his heels, doing absolutely nothing for about three months. During which time, my grandmother gave birth to my mother, and they got on a troop ship and came back to this country. And I think my mother was still three weeks old. However, they got back safely. Much to his relief. And then he was told, it's faintly possible you may get the Canadian division, but you've got to go and receive them. So he spent the next six months down in the south of England, around High, Dover, Folkestone, sort of acquiring bits of land to put up bell tents to receive the Canadians. And all that entails of creating an environment for a division to come. And you would see in his diary that he's getting incredibly frustrated by all this, but he did it, and he did it, and he did it. And then Yes, um, on the 2nd of August, 1915, his diary said, in the morning, he said, I've just been told that steel is getting the Canadians. And then, you know, boom, boom, boom. However, in the afternoon, telegram from the military secretary ordering me to embark for the continent tomorrow and take over the 50th division. I did not know there was such a division. <laughs> so there he was, suddenly, boom, off, stuff in the kit and off he went. And in fact, it was a, he by then was what in those days was known as a, a dugout, i.e. he'd basically been passed over for more command. He would have been, he would have been 50. I don't know that old for generals in those days, but he'd been a native commander and you know, he didn't have the highest, so he, he wasn't in with the top people. But it was an absolute perfect thing for him. The 50th Northumbrian Division, where all the territorial battalions, five Northumberland Fusiliers, three Durham Light Infantry, North Yorks, East Yorks, one Lancashire Regiment and the Border Regiment, all territorials. And off they went, and for the next two and a half years, he led them in and out of all the horrible things of that world. Again, I could spend hours going through the details of what he did. 
and he did get wounded once, but not terribly seriously. Um, he obviously was a very good divisional commander, because uh, it's quite often in the army, a major who's been passed over for command, but because he's been such a jolly good soldier up to that point, but people reckon he's not command, he's, he's an organiser or administrator, he'll get an MBE, and it's a sort of sop for not going on to Lieutenant Colonel. Well, he, when he was in India, got a CMG, which, as you all know, is the commander of St. Michael and St. George, which again would be given to a brigadier who had been passed over. But he got his CMG, and while he was at the front, and again, it may have been because he, they knew he was never going to go any further because he was, wasn't political enough, he was too much of a warrior, not enough of a political officer. He was nice, he got a KCMG. You know about CMGs, call me God. <laughs> KCMG, kindly of call me God. <laughs> GCMG, God calls me God. <laughs> anyway, he got his KCMG in the field, um, and during the time they fought at Arras, and they fought, they didn't take part in the Somme, they were at the edge of the Somme, his division, but they were obviously a very good division, and Grandfather was obviously uh, terribly careful. Um, to make sure that as few of his soldiers got killed as possible. It didn't say they weren't brave or didn't get them to do things. The grandmother operated an enormous amount of effort to make sure they got the best covering fire they could get. And I'm sure there are some of you chaps around here who have done soldiering and you know fire and movement and all sorts of rules about two up and bags of smoke. And really hands up anybody who remembers that phrase. Ah. Well, when I was a young officer and you were told to make a plan for an attack, um, the quick answer was two up and bags of smoke. I, you had a division, you had a, a unit, like a company, with three platoons. Well, you put two platoons up, and you had one in reserve. And you absolutely covered the objective with as much smoke as you possibly could, so nobody could see them coming. And that was a simple plan of attack in those days. And Grandfather subscribed to that. And there was a moment when he had a new Lieutenant General put over him called Maxi. Um, who absolutely got up his nose. He actually came and told him, what are you going to do this? What are you going to do that? What are you going to do the other thing? And he was mad about sort of better use of small arms and the rest of it. And grandfather said, you're, you're missing the point. The chaps can all fire their rifles. What we've got to do is to have more ways of blanking off the enemy before we attack them. That's what we need. Go and invent the tank or something. And anyway, I just say that in passing because Max actually comes up much later on. Um, he did his two and a half years and came away summa cum laude, as they say, and got the most marvellous job. He was appointed Inspector General of Musketry, <laughs> which again was a super job for him, because he was very good with his right. He knew a lot about small arms and handled them all his life. And it involved going around all the training areas, all around Britain, where infantry training took place. And there were... Um, your Barry Button up there, which is a highly sort of tight thing, and you've got absolute arcs of fire, um, and you've got to be very careful about it, but that's a Scottish one. And then just over the border, you've got Otterburn, which is mostly for the big guns. And the officer there would say, well, um, you can fire anywhere in there, um, the full range of your guns, it won't hurt anybody. <laughs> totally different thing. If you kill any sheep, well, don't waste them, take them in and let's cut them up and let's have them for dinner. You know. And I took part in, um, when I was at Eaton Hall, we did a live, live fire training at Trosvinith in Wales. And there were lots of sheep all over the firing ranges. And again, it was, you know, you could shoot. And what would happen was you, you're going along like that, and the officer in charge would fire a tracer shot at say a range post way over there and that was the sign around the fire so you all rushed forward and they were brutes these officers because they knew jolly well that when they went like that just in front of you was a, a waist deep bog so you rushed and, and you went um how oh, that's by the by and anyway his job was to go around make sure they were working properly his job was to uh, 
inspect <coughs> new concepts of small arms and make sure the training practices, etc., were, were all up to date. And he brought back with him what they were actually doing at the front, so they were perhaps ahead of the theorists back in this country. But it got him driving all around the country and popping in to see friends, um, nipping out and fishing some useful stream somewhere. And the only downside was that this was the very early days of motor cars. And he went everywhere by motor car, except when he went from London to Newcastle by train. And they kept getting punctures. Oh, another puncture. And they, they got quite good at mending them. But that was a, a hazard of doing that sort of job. And I have a, a motor coat. I have a splendid, huge, great tweed motor coat which has always been known as the profiteer in the family, um, which he obviously had made for him for driving, not necessarily in uniform, um, around the countryside in the middle of winter in an open car. And it's a marvellous car. I, I, I once wore it myself and it saved my life up in the highlands in the middle of the winter. My car broke down and I had to spend the night in the car and I had the profiteer to wrap around me. And I visioned my grandfather doing exactly the same way back in 1919, 1920. Anyway, on he went with this. Um, and actually, not he, he was still well short of the two years he might have expected to have done it. And he got, in 1919, May, he was offered the job of commanding the 50th Territorial Division for the second time, but in peacetime. And this was a marvellous two years of his life. Um, he and Granny and my aunt and my mother had this nice house at Richmond, close to the Catrick training camp, which was the sort of centre of it all. And again, his job was to make sure that everything was working throughout the division. But he knew everybody, and they all knew him. And he obviously was popular because my grandma said that you know, he'd suddenly invite him to go shooting up on the mowers. And after the first drive, all the beasts would come rushing up to shake him by the hand. <laughs> and they'd all fall down, oh, 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 oh. Um, So again, they were two very, very happy years. Again, I can't go into too much detail, because it's, a lot of it, again, is the performance of the mobile laundry and bath unit, and that sort of thing, which he had to be on top of all. But he obviously was incredibly popular, because when he came to an end, which was, and it was going to be the end of his career, he was told he wasn't getting any further. Um, there was a huge stramash in the, um, the Newcastle, the Northern Club in Newcastle, and virtually everybody who had ever served under him, all the officers, came to the dinner, and they had a hell of a party, a hell of a thrash, and there were people waiting outside. And, I, I, I'm batting for him because he was such a... Oh yes, I tell you what, I digress back. Back to the war when he was still out there. Um, that thing. In the old days, armies marched and they had their baggage trains behind them. By the First World War, where you had at least 50 divisions, and you had more because the Highlanders were the 51st and the Lowlanders were the 52nd, you needed divisional transport. And they were given a water cart. And they all said, how do we distinguish our water cart from their water cart? So they said, we're going to put a sign on the side of it. And so what sign should we have? So grandfather said, well, here, yeah, have my family crest, the unicorn's head. So they did, and they produced two of those, one on each side. Well, time went on, and it dispensed water as required. Um, then he came back home, and just at the end of the First World War, he got th that with its clerk on it and this letter, I'm talking provenance here, from Colonel Jackson, who took over the division from him, saying that, did I write it down here? I won't bore the dates, but sometime in May of 1918, when the Germans made their last big push, and pushed us back a bit, which was their last effort. And then we pushed them back again, pushed them again. But during that big push, the water car was overrun and captured. Well, eight days before the armistice, 
the 5th Fifth Division caught up with it again and brought it home again. And it had finished its use. So Colonel Jackson obviously cut them all, sent one to Grandfather and probably sent the other to Annick Castle where the Northumbrian military lies. And I don't think that's worth anything in terms of being an antique, but its provenance is so utterly perfect that I, I got in touch with the um, antiques roadshow people who are coming to Flores Castle on the 7th of July and said, here it is, and I don't want to sell it or anything like that, but what I would like to know is, is it of importance to collectors of military? And, you know, I have Colonel Jackson's letter that accompanied it. I should wait and see. Here, it's a girl on my grandfather. I shouldn't think it's worth anything, but it, it, it has history. Anyway, there was grandfather at the end of his military career. And he's not here, but he may be listening. I will read, because while he was doing that, his new general, the Lieutenant General above him, was General Maxey. And he got on fracture well with General Maxey after the war. Confidential Report 1921. There is prevalent in this division a particularly happy camaraderie and a noticeable atmosphere of mutual confidence as between the staff and the various units. I attribute this to Sir Percival Wilkinson's personal influence and to his undoubted zeal and popularity. In his division, in his area, and in the counties concerned, his popularity is universal. And then his final report, the following year, Major General Sir Percival Wilkinson commands the best trained and most happily constituted division in Northern Command. And I doubt whether there can be many better territorial divisions in Great Britain. At Patrick Camp, I saw each of the three infant brigades carry out attacks of which any regular brigade might well be proud. Its artillery practice was also excellent. And that was his last report as a soldier. However, he wasn't rich. While he was in, I think, North, second year in North Nigeria, um, he got a message that his father had died. And I have his entry for Christmas of that year. And he'd taken off with a bearer um, to go and just have some time to himself. And he was obviously sitting by his fire and roasting a bit of some deer that he'd shot and saying, um, far better to be here than at home and everybody crying over the fact that everything's got to be sold. I mean, his father and his grandfather lived the life of O'Reilly and never earned a penny. And by the time his father died, the whole place was mortgaged to the hill, and so it had to be sold. And his other brothers, Wilfred died of appendicitis, and he was a parson. And the two next brothers, um, Philip and oh God, Harry, had gone to Canada. Because an uncle, another, another general, said, come out to Canada and there's plenty of land to pick it up and break it in. Um, not Harry, Ted. And Ted came back during the war with my grandfather's ADC for a bit, Canadian Army. But anyway, they'd all gone and Clem had been killed in the First World War. So there was only the three daughters left and they'd all married on. And one married um, a school teacher and they went out to New Zealand and started a whole new dynasty. I digress again. I was out there, as I say, at ADC to the Governor General, and we were having dinner at the Christchurch Club. Top table, two side tables. And at the top here was the Governor General and the President of the club. And he was telling the Governor General, whoever he was, he got to me and said, that's Gare Blunt. And the Governor General said, no, it's not. It's my ADC, Captain Timothy Usher. His cousin, Gare Blunt, is sitting opposite him. And the President apparently went, hmm, hmm. He said, Harry, he said, I've known Gare since he was in since he was in nappies, that's uncanny, <laughs> uh, family likeness. And yet it was always up close together, but we didn't really like each other at all, it was just a sort of impression. Anyway, oh dear, I'm running over time. Um, also, when he was commanding uh, the TA for the second time, 
they had um, the general strike. And there was one of those occasions, which some of you may have read about in the past, where the soldiers were turned out to sort of protect places from being mobbed up by the strike.